Because one of the first points that I want to make is just how much uh, really important thinking about development has come right from the beginning from the periphery and from parts of the world uh, that some of which you know, might now be described as, 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 as regional powers. It's what I really want to do in my, in my little talk is uh, really to, em to make that point very strongly to begin with, the importance of, of ideas from the periphery in the development of uh, development theories. And then I, I want to, uh, to talk about the implications of the rise of new powers for uh, development theory. Um, and, and I think you know, what I want to say there uh, relates to the first of, of your tensions, uh, David, because I really want to, to argue that um, the uh, rise of the developmental states and then uh, the, uh, the rise of, of China, India, uh, Latin uh, Brazil uh, has, in a sense, um, I, I think, really quite fundamentally uh, overturned uh, development theories as they had uh, developed through to around uh, the turn of this uh, of this century. So that's my kind of uh, my kind of an agenda. Um, I think I've got far more on this thing than I uh, than I can possibly uh, get through. So. Let me just, much of it is, is just simply on this, uh, on this slide. Um, I, the history of development theory, as I, as I trace it, um, uh, is, is uh, of, of course, uh, theories about development, ideas about development, have deep historical roots. Historical roots in the work of the classical economists, in Marx, in thinkers like Friedrich List quite early in the 19th century. But, you know, something happened around the middle of the last century uh, and after the Second World War, international development became a major international project. Um, uh, and uh, it was in that period, immediately after the Second World War, that a great deal of, uh, of the foundations of development theor theorizing really, was really built. It was theorizing which contributed to uh, the body of, of ideas, the body of theory that I refer to as structuralism, which was really pretty, uh, pretty much the, the, the orthodoxy uh, in the 1950s <coughs> into the 1960s and in a way continued uh, in the in the nineteen in the nineteen seventies, it was uh, uh, an, an orthodoxy which I think is quite well summed up uh, by by Colin Lees in his history of development theory, when he says that you know the objective in this period was was economic growth, increasing G GDP, the agent of, of development was the state. The means of development was economic planning in the context of the sort of macroeconomic framework which was established at, at Breton Woods uh, that John Ruggie uh, later referred to, described in, in terms of the idea uh, of uh, in embedded liberalism. And the sort of point that I want to emphasize you know, in relation to, to that remark of yours, Bruce, was really to emphasize uh, the role of key thinkers uh, from the periphery in the development of that body of, uh, of theory. Structuralism was the orthodoxy um, of development theory, I think until around the middle of the 1960s, when there was uh, what some people at the time described as a crisis of planning. That was actually the title of quite a big conference that was held at the Institute of Development Studies in Sussex. It was part of the title of uh, what for Indianists, a very important book, The Crisis of Indian Planning, uh, which was published in, 19, in 1968. And uh, following that, there was, uh, through the 1970s, there were attempts, I think, really to, really to reform um, structuralist theories. By that stage, uh, the, the Lester Pearson report had been published, which drew attention to the fact 
that though the immediate preceding couple of decades had seen very high rates of economic growth generally across the world, and it is, of course, the period which is described uh, by some uh, as the golden age, the golden age of, of capitalism, the highest rates of growth across the world that there have ever been uh, in that period from about the end of the 1940s to the middle of the, to the, middle of the 1960s. So um, a crisis of, of planning, the recognition that for all the high rates of growth which had been achieved in the previous couple of, couple of decades, there was still enormous poverty <coughs> around the world. And in the 1970s, I think we began to see a very clear focus upon the problem uh, of, of poverty. And that was sought to be addressed uh, in a, a, an approach to development which was outlined in the book called Redistribution with Growth, published in 1974, which, you know, the argument was given away in the title. We bring about redistribution of the, of the fruits of, of, of growth, and it basically advocated a focus upon particular, uh, particular groups, small farmers, and informal sector workers in particular. And it was in the 1970s that rural development came to be uh, seen as perhaps the, the, as it were, the spearhead um, of, uh, uh, of, of development. Rural development had to be tackled in order to tackle the problems uh, of, uh, of poverty. In this period as well, we saw the, develop, uh, the, the development of the dependency critique uh, of, this, of structuralist <coughs> orthodoxy. And uh, I'm now going to be you know, giving away state secrets about how terribly old I now am. When I came into, into development studies um, in the later 1960s, you know, the big book for us all uh, was Capitalism and Underdevelopment in Latin America uh, by somebody called André Gunder Frank, who was later a colleague of his. Um, uh, as I uh, would like, you know, I'd like to emphasize that um, uh, at the, in the same year uh, that Frank published Capitalism and Underdevelopment in Latin America, of course, Cardoso and Folletto uh, published in Spanish. I won't try to say it in Spanish because I don't think my pronunciation is good enough, but uh, de Development and Dependency in, in Latin America. Um, uh, and uh, you know, of, the, of the two, I think it was in the 1960s, the 1970s, it was the frank version of dependency theory which you know, really uh, took off and influenced uh, very many students like, like me. But that was partly because, stupid us, we couldn't actually read Cardoso and Folletto. <laughs> we didn't read Cardoso and Folletto until the English translation was published in 1979. And then we realized that Cardoso and Folletto actually presented a very much more nuanced, historically informed uh, account um, of dependency in Latin America, which was you know, much less, um, uh, yeah, much less what, what it's sort of big top view of, of, of capitalism than that uh, presented by, uh, by Frank. The end of the 1970s, um, events really kind of started to, uh, to upset uh, the development of theorizing uh, about development because of the events of the, of the 70s, the oil price rise, um, the pumping out of, of credit into the what was still called the third world, um, then the Volcker shock at the end of the, the 1970s, and in the 1980s, the rise um, of, uh, of neoliberalism. Um, 1989, uh, it was a grey publication, <coughs> not something which was at the time uh, public, but the World Bank uh, produced a report on what was happening as a result of, uh, of the introduction of structural adjustment programs across Africa and found uh, that the record of what had actually happened was 
should we say uh, very modestly, extremely disappointing. And of course, subsequently, uh, distinguished African scholars and others have spoken of the lost decade in African development as a result um, of, the, uh, of the failures of structural adjustment programs. And that, I think, brings about in the 1990s a crisis of, uh, of development theory. The limitations of structuralism had clearly become evident uh, by the end of the, of the, 19, the 1960s. <clears throat> the limitations of neoliberalism were already apparent uh, as we turned into the, into, the 19, into the 1990s. And it's sort of about this moment, it's about, it, it is at about this point that the significance of uh, of the development of the East Asian NICs, the developmental states of East Asia uh, was really uh, was really no was really recognised. My namesake, who only has one S on his name, Nigel Harris, uh, published a book called *The End of the Third World*, uh, published in 1986, which uh, is, I think, an important marker of the recognition of the significance of the development of Taiwan uh, and, and South Korea uh, in, in particular. Um, how am I doing for time? I'm thinking I'm talking for time. Five. Five minutes, okay. So, let me, let me sort of, um, uh, well, let me just go, finish going through this and then come back on some of the points from it. I'm not going to get beyond what's on this, uh, on this slide. Um, I put there East Asian miracle because I think a very, for me, a very significant sort of moment is the, uh, the, the debate which went on over the publication uh, by the World Bank in 1993 uh, of, a, of a book on the, the East Asian miracle, the Asian miracle. Why I think that is significant is because uh, it, it started out as being an account of how the pursuit of, of neoliberal policy was what accounted for the success of the East Asian newly industrialized uh, economies. Um, this, of course, was what Deepak Lal had argued um, in his little book, The Poverty of Development Economics published in 1983, that Korea was so successful because it had pursued export-oriented uh, industrialization. Um, and it was that sort of story uh, which the bank set out to tell in its account of the, of the, Asian, the Asian miracle. But of course, unfortunately, the study was funded by the Japanese. Unfortunately for some people in the World Bank, the study was, was financed by the, uh, by the Japanese because the Japanese didn't recognize the story that the bank was trying to tell about Japan as well as other e East Asian countries. And so there was a, a considerable debate in the bank about, the, uh, about what this text should, uh, should, should contain. And eventually, uh, the work that had been done and published by that stage by Alice Amston on, on South Korea and by Robert Wade on, on Taiwan uh, had really entered in, uh, entered into the, I suppose it's say into the, into the discourse. And so the recognition of the role of states in the title of Robert's book in governing the market, the recognition in Alice Amston's words, of the significance of getting the prices wrong. Um, the fact that these successful uh, East Asian economies had at different times, at different moments, pursued import substitution industrialization or export-oriented industrialization. Um, these points all had to be uh, taken uh, account of uh, in the uh, in the East Asian miracle uh, story. And I think it was, it was the recognition um, that the East Asian story 
uh, bore out neither structuralist theory nor uh, liberal um, e economic theory, which uh, in a way underlines the development a little bit later of the of the post Washington uh, consensus. And I think it is now it has now led through to. I'm suggesting I think I can begin to see a new theoretical synthesis, uh, which uh, my former colleague Teddy Brett refers to uh, as the development of pluralist uh, institutional, institutional theory. Pluralist institutional theory, which actually, uh, one of its fundamental points is to take context very, very seriously. Um, it's to recognize that, you know, there ain't, there ain't no, uh, no model. To recognize, in the words of Michael Woolcock again and Lark Pritchett, that the solution in development is actually the problem. You know, the idea that we, so we know what the, the developed state, the developed economy should look like, and it looks something metaphorically like Denmark. Um, and they're arguing that, you know, aiming for Denmark just ain't, doesn't, doesn't make, doesn't make sense. Okay, um, I just want to come back on this little outline that I presented um, of, uh, as I see it, the development of development theories over the last uh, 60, 70, uh, 70 years, uh, really to emphasize, uh, as I see, you know, what I said I was going to say at the beginning um, of, of my remarks about the implications of the, the rise of the East Asian developmental states and the emergence, if you will, of the new powers, especially China, um, uh, India, uh, and, and Brazil, uh, for, uh, for development, development theorizing. Key thinkers from the periphery. I'm just going to go back uh, to that point, and it comes back to my slight uh, sort of quarrel with, with Bruce's point in his introductory remarks. Who are the really important thinkers um, in the late in the 1940s, 1950s? Paul Rosenstein Rodin, um, born, in, uh, born in Krakow. Alexander Gershenkron, um, born, in, uh, born in Odessa. Uh, Ragna Nurkse, born somewhere in, uh, somewhere in Estonia. Um, then people like uh, um, Albert Hirschman, Hans, uh, Hans Singer, German Jews, born I think both of them in, in Berlin. And then uh, for me two very important people, uh, Friedrich Hayek on the one hand and Karl Popper on the other, both of whom came uh, yeah. from uh, both of whom were born in Vienna and both of whom worked in Vienna yeah. uh, in the 1920s and into the 1930s, there were different roles. And I, like, I just like to speculate on what would have happened if Karl Popper, uh, sorry, um, uh, Polanyi, uh, if Polanyi uh, had, as he very nearly did, taken a job at the London School of Economics in 1948. <laughs> I like to think of Hayek and Polanyi, uh, you know, arguing it out in the senior common room at the LSE, but unfortunately that never happened. These are, in, in, and, and you know, the, 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 the implicit sort of debate between Hayek uh, and Polanyi, I think it is really, it, it is very, it's fun, the fundamental uh, debate of, of development theory, it seems to me. Polanyi's critique um, of the, what he calls, uh, you know, the utopian idea of the self-regulating uh, market. The most sort of powerful historical and moral critique of, uh, of economic liberalism on the one hand, and Hayek's most incredibly articulate sort of exposition um, of, uh, of economic liberalism uh, on, the, on the other. These are some of the, the most important development thinkers Add to that uh, the role uh, of, uh, of Arthur Lewis from the West Indies, 
and of course from here uh, Raoul, Raoul Trebisch. Um, uh, the most important thinkers, I think, all come from what might be sort of described as the as the as the periphery. So now then, jump to my to my sort of last point, which is about how, if you will, I think that the rise of the uh, of the East Asian mix and subsequently India China and so on has really quite fundamentally uh, transformed uh, development theorizing. Because I think the experiences um, of these different emerging or, or regional powers, if you will, falsify uh, the nostra of structuralism uh, and of, of, of neoliberalism. Um, and I think point to, uh, point to the limitations um, of, of theory. I'm just going to whiz through these to a little quote that I want to uh, nearly end with. It's actually a, it's a quotation taken from a speech given before the uh, Royal Economic Society, actually by an economic historian, Phyllis Dean, a good many years ago. The lesson that we draw from the history of economic thought, and I would say from the history of development of, and of development theory, is that economists, and I add, and others of course, should resist the pressure to embrace a one-sided or restrictive consensus. There's no one kind of economic truth which holds the key to fruitful analysis of all economic problems, no pure economic theory that is immune to changes in social values or current policy problems. I, maybe that's all perfectly obvious to everybody in this room, um, but um, I'm afraid I think that uh, very often um, we do need to be a little bit more humble uh, about our, our, our theoretical our theoretical <coughs> claims, the claims uh, for, for particular, particular bodies of, of thought. And, and just to end uh, with a, a little bit more of a reflection on, uh, on what's happening in China, in India, uh, Brazil, um, that I think really poses a challenge for, uh, for theorizing about development. And, that is, of course, that all three of these great countries, big economies, are, I think, tackling the same problem, which really isn't embraced at all in any of the great body of, of development theory. And that is the problem of excluded labor, the problem of the exclusion of large masses of labor from uh, employment in productive, productive enterprise. That is perhaps particularly true um, of, uh, of India, but I think it's, uh, it, it's, there's a lot of uh, truth in it in regard to both China and Brazil as well. And all three of these big countries, big economies, have introduced in the recent past things that are really rather remarkable um, basically social welfare programs, social welfare legislation, which certainly sort of flies in the face um, of, of neoliberal uh, orthodoxy. Um, and, and, you know, it represents a, a, a trying to tackle what has become, it's, I think it seems to many policy makers in those countries, it certainly seems to me to be a really extremely, a fundamental problem about which our existing theory actually doesn't really help us very much uh, to tackle. Yes.